Yep. Hi, everyone. Happy New Year and welcome to our first web reader of the year. My name is Jerry and I am the host for today. So finally, we have arrived at the last topic of our IP at case study series, uh, which has been running since March last year. So today, our presentation is about the IP strategy of Apple, one of the world's most valuable company known for creating gadgets like iPhone, iPads, uh, Apple Watch, iPods, etc. So it's a brand that is able to maintain a huge loyal fan base, uh, whether it's due to the product's functionality, uh, aesthetics, ecosystem, or it's because of self-identity or social identity reasons. So in our new web Venus series for this year, 2023, um, we, uh, which is the pattern strategy case study series, we will focus more on the pattern strategies of other world leading companies. So the first webinar will fall on the 30th of March uh, at 2 p.m. Singapore time, and we'll be talking about Amazon, uh, which is most well known for its e-commerce platform. So before we start, let me go through the housekeeping rules. So you can submit text questions to our speaker at any time uh, during his presentation by typing your questions in the chat box. And we will collect them and try to address as many questions as possible during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. And if you are currently watching us on Facebook, uh, please do us a favor by sharing the, uh, the webinar to your family members and also your friends by clicking the share button. All right, so before we start, as usual, we would like to know more about you. So please introduce yourself and uh, your company's name uh, by tapping in the chat box. And if you have uh, a website link, uh, please share it with us as well. All right, so I see that we have about 47 participants here. So, uh, yep, hi. Um, uh, so, so, yeah, I, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Uh, Bareja from PNG. So, okay, so while waiting for your response, uh, yep, let me just uh, run a very quick survey. So I understand that there are a lot of Apple fans out there. So I'm not sure if you are one of them. So let me know, even if you are not a fan, on whether you have owned or you are currently owning any Apple products. So please select one if you have owned an iPhone before or you are using one right now. So, and if you are an iPad user, please choose two. All right, so any Mac users here? It seems that uh, there are a lot of iPhone users here. So if you are using a Mac computer, whether it's an iMac or a MacBook, please type three. So production of iPod was discontinued last year, but you, if you have once owned an iPod, uh, please select uh, number five. Um, yep, I used to own an iPod, the first generation of an iPod Nano that was ages ago. So I miss out Apple Watch. So if you are using Apple Watch, uh, please uh, choose four. But I believe uh, if you are using an Apple Watch, you must be using an iPhone too because you need an iPhone to pair with the Apple Watch. So if you are not using any of these, uh, you are using other Apple products like maybe AirPods uh, or Beats headphone um, that is owned by Apple as well. Or if you are using any uh, like Apple TV devices or HomePod mini speakers, uh, you can choose number six but it's not inclusive of the fruit apple, all right? So, or if you have never owned uh, any Apple products before, uh, you may also let us know by typing seven in the chat box. So we have a lot of uh, replies here. So let me just go through it. So hi, Shirley from Sign Derby, and we have uh, Daisy Mlaka too from Hichanova. So hi, um, yeah. So Jennifer, hi. And Jiaxing, hi from iPods. So Zaiti Zainal, so hi. Uh, all right, so yeah, so a lot of iPhone users here we have. 
Oh, Jiaxing is using, oh, you have never used any Apple products before. So Saumya uh, Bareja is using iPhone, iPad, and also Mac. Why Hui Chua? Oh, it's not, has never used any Apple products. Oh, Darwin chose iPhone. So Chua is using, and I think Chua has used an iPod before. So a lot of you have chosen iPhones and iPads and also I, uh, Apple Watch. So hi, Erica. So Zaiti is using a lot of Apple products or have used a lot of Apple products before. Oh, Siu Ying as well. So I believe you are all Apple fans. So Cockway is using an iPhone. So hi. Hi, Misao. And Timothy is using iPhone and iPad. Yeah, I'm using an iPhone and iPad too. <laughs> so, oh, Erica is a huge Apple fan. So, hi, Weijin. Hi, Kai. Oh, Kai is never, uh, Kai, Lee Kai is not using any uh, Apple products. And Weijin is using an iPhone. Yeah, so we have uh, yeah, a lot of responses here. And it seems that most of you are using an iPhone. Uh, yeah, Shiyin Ui is using yeah, a lot of Apple products as well, and also uh, Taiwook. So hi, Dixon. And hi, Guraj. All right. So thank you for your responses. So the majority of you have responded number one. So it seems that iPhone is very popular. Yep, it has been very popular ever since its release. All right, so thank you for your responses. So before we start, I would like to introduce our speaker today. He's Mr. Lok Chun Hong, the founding partner of Hintas IP Group, which has been established for more than uh, 20 years. So Mr. Lok is a very experienced IP practitioner. So he's uh, very active and experienced in handling uh, IP protection and monetization methods in the Southeast Asia region. So uh, without further ado, uh, please welcome Mr. Lo. Yeah, uh, thank you, Jai. Uh, thank you, Jai, for the introduction. I'm trying to start my video. Okay, Jai, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, let me just share my screen. Okay, Jai, can you see my screen? Yep, I can see your screen. You are sharing the desktop, right? Okay. Yeah, hi. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, Happy New Year and thank you for attending our webinar uh, organized by INTAS IP Group and also GIP ASEAN. Uh, today, uh, we are going to carry out the last installment in our series of IP case studies uh, by looking at Apple. Uh, we would like to see uh, uh, some of the important IP found by Apple and how Apple uses IP, intellectual property rights, to support some of its innovation strategy. Okay, so uh, in the following uh, 45 minutes, right, I'm going to carry you through uh, some of the game-changing product uh, by Apple and some of the important uh, patterns found by Apple's. Okay, uh, short introduction. Uh, I'm an IP a lawyer by profession. I've uh, been in practice for more than 20 years. Uh, I'm active, actively involved in the IP protection and monetization in the Southeast Asian regions. So uh, I would like to uh, start by uh, saying that, you know, I believe Apple is the most innovative company in the world. Uh, the company has created many game-changing innovation like the personal computers, iPod, iPhone, iPad, iTunes. All these products revolutionized the way 
we use computer and we use handphone. So uh, in this presentation today, I would like to share uh, how IP was used by Apple to protect its innovation and how Apple uses IP to protect its market share and also profit margin. So this is what uh, we would like to set out to do in our webinar today. Uh, as you all know, uh, Apple was started by two legendary founder, uh, Steve Jobs, the late Steve Jobs, and also Steve Warwick way back in 1976. Uh, when Steve Jobs passed away in 2011, uh, Tim Cook took over the baton and continued to grow Apple to what it is today. Uh, in Jan on January 3rd, uh, 2022, uh, you know, the Ford magazine reported that Apple has hit the market valuation of $3 trillion. Uh, it is the first ever company in the world to have ever reached the high watermark of $3 trillion valuation. So we would like to see, you know, what is the secret sauce of the Apple success, right? What drives the success of Apple? And for that, I would like to refer to the a framework proposed by Professor Potter of Harvard University uh, Prof Professor Porter's, uh, you know, uh, proposed that you know to be competitive to achieve sustainable competitive advantages, uh, companies can either uh, try to provide cost leadership and cater to the mass market, or you have to be very differentiated in your product or services and focus on a certain niche market. Uh, the worst thing that a company can do wrong is to be stuck in the middle, right? Trying to be everything to be to everyone. So in the case of Apple, we can see that, you know, uh, Apple follows a differentiation strategy and it focuses on people on a niche market that is willing to pay high premium for the differentiated product and services. Okay, let's look at uh, the value proposition of Apple. Uh, in 1997, uh, after Steve Beck rejoined Apple as its interim CEO, uh, Steve Jobs came up with a very clear statement of what Apple stands for. Uh, the uh, positioning statement of Apple by Steve Jobs is to think different. Yeah, this is the slogan and also a trademark of Apple. And the slogan portray Apple products and services as innovative and unorthodox. Uh, they will launch products which will be the trailblazer. Uh, it will be the trendsetter rather than be a follower. And in a very famous ad uh, put up by Apple, it associates uh, Apple's products and services with some of the most famous game changer and free thinker rebels uh, in human histories, uh, ranging from Albert Einstein, Thomas Edison to Picasso, right? So this is what Apple stands for. It, it, it wants to do things differently and also potentially uh, changing the world. And uh, by inference, you know, uh, Apple also target this type of customer, right? People who wants to be different. And if you happen to be an Apple user, then probably you are the, the, the one who also think differently. And uh, the other value proposition by Apple is, uh, as you can see in Apple's mission, is it aspires to bring the best user experience through innovative hardware, software, and services. And Apple was able for the past 20 years to leverage on its unique ability to design and develop its own operating system, hardware, software, and services to provide customer with attractive design, superior ease of use, and also seamless integration between the hardware and the software. 
And we are going to see today, right, some of those very important and famous design by Apple, how Apple protects it by way of industrial design or design pattern. And the superior ease of use through uh, a touch screen user interface uh, and also, you know, single button uh, interface, all these functionalities are also protected by Apple using patterns. And uh, uh, today uh, we are going to look at some of these, uh, especially uh, how some of the innovative features in iPhone was protected by various sets of IP. And another value proposition by Apple is uh, since 2019, Apple has started to focus more on the privacy of, of its user. Uh, uh, this is in direct uh, contrast to the Google and Facebook duopoly, uh, whose business model are based on utilizing the customer's database for advertising purposes, right? So what Apple has done is uh, it differentiate itself by respecting the privacy pro policy of its user more. Uh, they introduced a opt-in policy where uh, if you want, you, you have a choice whether you want to get tracked by the uh, other platform. Uh, the, defect, the default, before this, the default uh, policy was, you know, uh, your device will track your data, but Apple has reversed that. Apple make it uh, give the option to the user to opt in whether you want to get tracked or not, right? So these are the three differentiation that makes Apple different. And, and as you can see, uh, in over the years, Apple has come up with many uh, groundbreaking uh, products uh, starting by the desktop uh, personal computing, Apple II in 1977, to Macintosh with its uh, unique uh, operating system, the simple user interface in 1984, to iPod that offers digital music players in your pocket in 21, 2001, and to the iTunes store in 2003, where you can purchase legal uh, music, authorized music uh, online. Uh, and in 19, uh, 2007, uh, iPhone was launched. Uh, it is a, a, a new types of, uh, a new types of uh, smartphone that changes the way, you know, we, uh, we use our mobile device up to today. And in 2010, uh, Apple also launched uh, uh, iPad tablets. So what Apple have done over the years yeah, is to uh, create, uh, it's not to exploit the existing demand, but to reconstruct the existing industrial boundary to create new market space to meet the unlock uh, latent demands. Like for example, you know, uh, by introducing iPhone, uh, the, the latent demand were, were to, uh, you know, you want to have a more uh, easier way to interact. You don't need to have so many buttons, a more uh, convenient user-friendly way to navigate your, your mobile phone. Apple sees the latent demand. So uh, Apple relied more uh, on the software, the operating system to, to allow people to control their phone using their touch screen. And also the latent demand of the user is to be able to customize their phone, right? And Apple was the first to come up with a app store for you to download thousands of applications that you want into your computing device or into your mobile device, and you can customize uh, your needs uh, according, your phone according to your need. And these are very revolutionary and until today, you know, this is the div, this is the standard of uh, the mobile phone up to today. Okay, so I would like to focus uh, on one product uh, for, uh, to look at the strategy of I, uh, Apple, which is iPhone. You know, uh, if you look at the early uh, 2000, uh, we have a lot of 
smartphone. We have a lot of uh, mobile phone around, but you know, all the players were trying to outdo each other by adding in more desktop-like functionality and hardware. You know, if you can remember our key phone, you know, we add in MP3 player, game console, digital camera uh, to make our your product to have more functionality, right? But what Apple did was Apple come up with a totally different approach. Uh, rather than making or adding more hardware feature, Apple invested in developing a more reliable operating system in iOS and using this iOS to provide a more intuitive user interface. And when iPhone first came out, everybody was scratching their head. You know, this product only have four buttons, right? The button in the middle of the, on the middle of the screen and three buttons at the side. The, the volume, uh, volume uh, adjuster and also the on off button. Only four volume, uh, four buttons and the touch, one touch screen. Yeah, because everything has turned software. Uh, it has, uh, it, it can be supported. All your interaction with the phone doesn't have to be done through buttons, but through your touch screen and uh, with a very, very reliable operating system. And afterwards, you will see, right? Today's purpose is to look at some of the pattern that protects those intuitive user interface and also those uh, 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 the functionalities that make the phone uh, unique. And also, at the same time, Apple also introduced a marketplace for apps. Before iPhone, there was no apps, right? iPhone was the first to come up with this idea of you able to customize your mobile phone using apps. And uh, you can download all these apps from its marketplace called iTunes. And iTunes allows user to explore, to choose, to purchase, to download. And you transform their iPhone into something more than just a voice and text device. It is a computing device. And iTunes also have a control mechanism that protects the copyright of the content that you download. Uh, this is uh, what uh, apps has done and it has changed the way we do, you know, we use mobile devices. And all these functions that we look at that we take for granted today was a very rationary product uh, functions in, in 2027 when iPhone was launched. And a lot of features are protected by IPs. And today we are going to look at some of those IPs. Okay. And as, if you look at iPhone, it's not just a piece of hardware, but it is uh, sitting on top of software, OS, marketplace, and it's one ecosystem, right? So Apple is able to own the entire ecosystem because you know the, it, it has a very it, it has a closed system compared to the Android phone or you know a Samsung phone where you you have to actually work with others to provide that ecosystem but Apple control everything internally. Okay so because of this very innovative approach and also the very strong uh, IP protection. Uh, for more, Apple has been launched to 2007, uh, and it's more than 15 years in the market. But yet, you know, it is still able to maintain very high premium. Yeah, if you look at Apple, uh, the latest model iPhone 14 Max, the cost is 500 US dollar, the selling price is 1000 US dollar, it has a gross margin of, of more than 100%, you know. Which other company can achieve that kind of premium for such a long time uh, without getting copied or being replaced or being uh, taken over by other companies? So this, this is a very remarkable fact and intellectual property actually play a, a part in preventing people from copying. And also, if you look at the uh, revenue of iPhone in 2022, uh, its revenue has shot over 205 billion, and that's 52% of Apple's revenue. 
And this is not a new product. It is a product that has been around since 2007. And if you factor in ancillary services like your Apple Care, Apple Pay, you know, and also ancillary products like the variable, put all together, and iPhone ecosystem account for 70 to 80% of Apple's revenue. So this is a remarkable product and it is sustainable. It has been successful since 2007 until today and it has a competitive edge which is sustainable and IP is one of the key factors that ensure the competitive advantage of iPhone and afterwards let's look at some of the key patent protecting iPhone. And uh, Apple obviously has a very strong economic mode. Right? Economic mode meaning something barrier of entry that prevent competitor from coming in, right? With such a high margin, with such a profitable uh, income, uh, Apple obviously uh, uses a lot of uh, barrier of entries to prevent people from coming in and taking away uh, its competitive edge. So in this case, you can see Apple has uh, uh, a lot of uh, economic mode. Economic mode as a concept was promoted by Warren Buffett, right? Warren Buffett uh, actually mentioned that he will only invest in companies with strong economic mode, meaning with had sustainable competitive advantage and able to gain profit for foreseeable future. And Apple definitely fit the, the profile of a strong a company with strong economic mode. And uh, the, the mode in the case of Apple is created by its intellectual property, its brand, its economy of scale, its network effect, and also some of the legal exclusivity. So today, uh, uh, the topic is to look at Apple as an IP case study. So we will focus on IP, uh, how Apple uses IP to protect its competitive edge. Uh, before I go into uh, IP Apple, I would like to just introduce a bit of what is IP. Uh, and uh, how does IP work, right? Uh, IP, uh, there are few types of IP. IP is a monopolistic right governed, given to you by the government for you to own your new ideas, right? Basically, uh, what uh, this is IP and uh, there are different types of IP. You have patterns that protect new technology, new invention. Today, we are going to see how iPhone and some of the key Apple's product how pattern you uh, Apple, uh, Apple uses pattern to protect those new innovation and uh, uh, solution. And uh, you also have copyright. Copyright protects the content, the original content. So some of the some of the graphical user interface and some of the content of Apple, uh, you know, in the form of its uh, video and write up, uh, is all protected by copyright. And uh, Trademark, again, uh, protects the goodwill. The word Apple and the logo uh, is protected by trademark and Apple owns more than 1,000 trademark. And design, uh, industrial design, or pat design pattern protects the outlook. And Apple as a company uh, is uh, focusing a lot on very attractive design, right? So all these attractive design are protected by industrial design. And of course, there's a lot of trade secret also in Apple, uh, which is protected uh, by you know, legal uh, means through contracts and all the administrative means. So uh, intellectual properties uh, is an asset, it's an intangible asset. Uh, you can put a value to your IP. Uh, afterwards, I'm going to share with you the value of uh, Apple's uh, IP. Uh, the most important uh, uh, characteristic of intellectual property is if you come up with a new idea, you have new design or new brand, and you protect it with intellectual property, then you have the monopolistic right over it, right? If anyone were to touch your IP, were to sell or to manufacture or to make something similar to your IP, uh, they will be infringing your rights, your legal rights, and you have the right to go after the infringer. And uh, IP, because it's a legal right, it has to come from government of the land, right? So it's jurisdictional name in nature. Uh, if you want a protection in a particular country, then you have to register it in those countries. 
And if you want to cover the world, then you have to go to multiple countries to protect your IP. And uh, last but not the least, all the IP have a lifespan. So you have to renew your IP uh, and to make sure that, you know, it is uh, not it is still in force. Uh, if it's expired, then uh, the, 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 your idea will uh, become public domain uh, knowledge and anybody will be able to use it. So these are the fundamentals of IP. And the engine of uh, intellectual property, uh, the main function of intellectual property is for you to own your idea, right? Uh, your functional idea can be owned by filing a pattern, uh, outlook, your attractive design can be protected by industrial design, your original content can be protected by copyright, and your brand can be protected by trademark. So if you don't own this idea, then the idea will be susceptible to copying. People can just take away what you have invented and there will be no economic mood, no barrier of entry to protect your idea. So today, you can see how Apple jealously protected all the innovation, all the idea that it generates. You know, Apple come up with a strategy, they want to be different. And in order to be different, you have to come up with certain uh, unique function, unique shape, and also uh, services and all these unique ideas have to be protected in order to own those ideas and to keep competitors at bay. Okay, so this is what intellectual property is about. And I would like to start with Apple uh, trademark. Uh, this is the world most famous mark and the world most valuable mark. Uh, Apple with the logo, uh, the Apple logo, right? And it, Apple also protects uh, the slogan, Think Different, and also some of the sub-products uh, like, you know, uh, uh, Apple Music, Apple Watch, Apple TV, all these are protected as trademark. All in all, Apple have registered more than uh, 1,000 trademarks for its logo, its branding, its slogan, and many other unique identifier owned by uh, Apple. Okay, so this is the uh, some history about the Apple trademark. Uh, actually, the word the brand Apple was originally owned for the class of music uh, by Beatles, right? The Beatles, the famous uh, uh, music group uh, Beatles, they actually. Uh, formed a company called Apple Corporation in 1968 and registered the trademark worldwide. So uh, the logo of uh, Apple Corp, the Beatles Apple Corp is actually a green apple. And uh, when Apple computer uh, start, started using the Apple logo and the Apple word, uh, Apple Corp, Beatles Apple Corp actually sue Apple for trademark infringement. And both parties agreed to settle, right? In 1981, by Apple computer paying Apple Corp 80,000 US dollar, and Apple computer agreed not to enter the music industry. That was the term of this settlement. But in 1988, right, uh, when Macintosh computer was introduced, Macintosh computer has some musical digital interface software, so also touches some music. So Apple Corp uh, took action against Apple Com computer in 1988 because the term that Apple computer not dealing with music was breached by Apple computer. So Apple uh, incorporated actually uh, App Apple computer again settled because they know that Apple has the upper hand. Apple Beatles, Apple Corp has the upper hand because they filed first and they've been using the mark. So for you to use Apple, uh, there's no way to fight. So they have to settle and Apple computer pay uh, 26.5 million US dollar to Apple Corp, Beatles Apple Corp, to secure the rights uh, for using, uh, you know, the Apple logo for, for selling computer and software only, right? Uh, not for music. Then 2003, again, another tension flare uh, because Apple Inc. at that time 
Apple computer at that time try to uh, sell iTunes, right? Uh, the iTunes download store sell music, and that again touched uh, music. So at that time, uh, there was another legal battle over the use of the word Apple, and both parties finally came to a settlement. The term was not disclosed uh, in 2023 when Apple computer tries to launch the iPhone, iTunes, uh, launch the iTunes. Uh, so uh, I think both parties, uh, I think the, the market estimate was 50 to 100 million was split to Beatles Apple Corp for the use of the Apple logo. So you can see from this example that, you know, a brand does not come cheap. Yeah, if you can, uh, if you have a new brand, uh, you should start own it first. Uh, before you start promoting it and and uh, if your product become very successful you know you, you probably would have to pay a lot more uh, to secure your brand so this is a bit of history of apple uh, trademark and apple is able to command very high premium right very high premium over 60 percent uh, for the use of the brand uh, this is one of the most powerful brand and uh, according to interbrand in year 2020 uh, it is valued at 322 million, uh, 323 million US dollar in 2020. 2020, yeah, the world's most powerful and valuable brand is Apple. And if you look at the market cap of Apple in 2020 and the valuation of the brand, you can see that the brand alone is worth more than 16% of the market's value of Apple. So that's the reason why I said that, you know, it's an asset, it can be valued and it contributes uh, a lot to your valuation. And Apple also has some misadventure, right? Uh, when it tried to launch iPad in China, uh, it discovered that, you know, the, it, the iPad brand was actually registered by a company called ProView. And, and this ProView, actually took actions against Apple in China for using the iPad brand. And because China is a very uh, important market for Apple, Apple has no choice but to buy the iPad trademark from ProView for 60 million US dollar. So uh, even though they have to pay 60 million US dollar to buy the brand, the market share, the share of Apple went up 1.3%, you know, after hearing the news. It's a good news that they are able to secure iPad brand in China despite having to pay 60 million US dollar because brand is very important. If the brand is taken up already by other competitor, then you have no right to use the brand. As powerful as Apple was, right? It still have to kowtow to the brand owner. If the brand is already registered by someone else, so you have to buy it back with 60 million US dollar. Let's proceed next with the pattern portfolio. And today I'm going to spend a bit more time on pattern, especially on the iPhone patterns. Uh, uh, Apple has a huge portfolio of patterns, uh, 72,000 plus pattern in 24,000 pattern families, right? So it's a very huge portfolio. And, uh, and uh, most of the patterns are found in countries in US where it is the, the home base of Apple, but also in China and Europe. And China has become more and more important because uh, you know a lot of manufacturing of Apple computers are done in China. So Apple pattern portfolio, you can see that uh, a lot of patterns by Apple are found in the category of telecommunication and software. Uh, this is totally understandable because iPhone, yeah, the, the most um, most important product is iPhone. But you can see that pattern, uh, Apple is quietly following a lot of patterns also in automotive vehicle and also uh, in AR and VR. Meaning, you know, uh, Apple is also making some inroad into the automotive vehicle, electrical uh, vehicle. Uh, it is a project which is kept very secretive by Apple. Until now, you know, when we do our research, we can't find any a uh, lot of information on the Apple car. Okay, and uh, Steve Jobs, the legendary uh, inventor and founder of Apple himself, has more than two, 323 patents under his name, right? So he is one of the greatest uh, inventor. Uh, he came up with a lot of uh, groundbreaking product. And today we are still benefiting from it, you know, from the personal computers uh, to the GUI, 
the graphical user interface of how we do computing to iPhone to iPad. And this is uh, the brainchild of uh, the founder of Apple. Okay, I'm going to bring you through very briefly on some of the uh, patterns uh, of historical importance to, uh, to, to Apple, starting from personal computers. Uh, this is the first pattern uh, on the PC found by Apple, Apple II pattern found in 1979. Uh, and if you look at the claim, uh, you can see what is the element owned by Apple, right? You cannot file, you know, when you have a file pattern, uh, you can claim that combination that you want to own. So by claiming this combination, this combination is owned by your company and no one can use that combination to produce similar product. So this is the Thing. So I'm going to just briefly look at it uh, because I'm going to focus more on the iPhone pattern because of time. Uh, but you can, if you're interested, you can take a look at this pattern that uh, described the uh, uh, Apple II computer. And Apple also jealously protect its innovative, attractive, minimalist uh, uh, design. Uh, this is the industrial design found by Apple to protect the keyboard of Apple II together with the monitor of Apple II. Uh, computer and also subsequently uh, Macintosh, the blue iMac, uh, the shape of the monitor was registered also as industrial design to prevent any copying of the shape as well as the shape of the mouse uh, 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 by Apple. Yeah, so I, all these are familiar product to us because one in one way or the other probably would have been using that uh, product in our office life. And also the Macintosh operating system is also another game-changing uh, product. It changes the way we interact with computer, right? Uh, in the past, you have to use very uh, complicated programming language to interact with computers. But Apple was the first to come up with this Macintosh operating system that you allow you to use your mouse and menus to click and interact with your computers. And this uh, operating system actually was started by Xerox in its Palo Alto Research Center. It's the famous Palo Alto Research Center that invented a photocopying machine. And they were the first one to come up with this concept of using mouse control and pixel-based graphical user interface. And Job, uh, Steve Job, uh, uh, took the idea and become the first one to develop it and put it in personal computer. And that was a case between Apple versus Microsoft over this uh, GUI, right? This graphical user interface, uh, this GUI introduced by Apple in 1988, in the 1980s, allowed the computer user to, you know, uh, use mouse uh, uh, to, point at the object and the menu, and you can instruct your computer to carry out the function. This was a revolutionary product in 1998. Microsoft at that time was developing, when Apple was developing the Macintosh prototype, they invited Microsoft to develop the productivity software, the, the words processing, the spread, spreadsheet and all that. So Gates was feared, was, you know, a, fascinated by this GUI. And they actually took the idea and came up with Windows 1.0. And Apple was furious, but because they had, Apple and Microsoft at that time, they have a close working relationship. So they came to a settlement where Apple licensed to make, uh, the, the, the GUI to, to Microsoft. But the agreement drafted by Microsoft was very wide that license also extend to future software of Microsoft. So Apple, uh, Microsoft took the, the opportunity to come up with my, uh, Windows 2.0 and you know, the subsequent version of Windows operating system also used the original uh, GUI idea by Apple. So what happened was, was you know, uh, Apple took Microsoft to court. They sued Apple to court for, the, for copying the look and feel. Uh, but the court say, hey, you cannot protect your look and feel, your, your idea uh, using 
uh, copyright. Yeah. So so uh, uh, so you don't have any pattern to protect yourself. So therefore, uh, some of the uh, design uh, was already licensed in the settlement agreement. So uh, because of that, you know, Apple cannot successfully get uh, sue Microsoft. So. Uh, so this is something a lesson to be learned is uh, if you have any new idea, you cannot protect it by, by copyright, you need to have a pattern. So uh, Apple learned the lesson well, and when Apple came up with this iTunes uh, GUI, Apple actually found a pattern for this iTunes. And this, uh, if, if you can, if you're interested, you can look at this iTunes uh, compute uh, software. Uh, it is actually a, a way, a method that a, a user interface that allows user to review, to browse, to preview, to purchase the media. And after you purchase the media, you can download it and use it offline, but you cannot transmit it. You cannot uh, share it, you know, to protect the copyright owner. Uh, this uh, function is built into the content that you buy using iTunes. You can use locally, but you cannot share. So this is the uh, unique feature patented by Apple uh, in this uh, GUI uh, solution. Okay, and then you have iPod. Uh, um, uh, iPod, uh, where the, for the first time, you are able to carry 1,000 songs in your pockets. And it was an instant hit. Uh, it captures 70% of the market share. And the other advantage is you can intuitively navigate your song using your thumb right so this app, I, 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 ipod was also protected uh, by this uh, pattern uh, where you know if you look at the claim it's a combination of using a rotary dial and a button in the middle for you to control very simple interface and you can choose song many many song and and when you want to play the song you just click on the button and you can display to show the song's name so this is the uh, famous iPod, which has uh, been displaced eventually by iPhone. And in order to do this, right, uh, you need to have a way where you can store 1,000 songs in one device. So to do that, they need to use certain technology. And this technology happens to be uh, patented by a Singapore company called Creative. Uh, recently, the founder of Creative has passed away. So I, I, I just... Uh, uh, use this uh, example to you know to show that you know uh, creative has a technology uh, automotive uh, auto automatic hierarchical categorization using meta tech already this method of storing multiple songs in one small device was patented by creative so apple has to pay creative 100 million to license the patent from creative in order to do iPod, right? So this is another example of, you know, if you have a good technology and you patent it, and if the big boys wants your technology, they will license it for you from you because you own the technology. And then I come at, I come to the Apple iPhone now, uh, which is uh, my focus for today. And I have another 15 minutes for this Apple iPhone uh, pattern. So in 2006, when, uh, Steve Jobs and Apple came up with this iPhone project, you know, everybody was wondering what IP should they protect? And Steve Jobs had a simple answer, right? He wants to patent them all. Anything that can be patented for iPhone, they want to patent it. But because the product is so revolutionary, it changed the telephone, the mobile phone entirely, right? With this touch screen, interface with this uh, apps, mobile apps that you can customize your, your computer, uh, your, your mobile phone with. So they come up with this pattern it all policy and you can see an obvious rise in 2007 in the number of patents filed because of this introduction of the iPhone, right? So everything that can be patented has been patented or was patented by them. So this brings us to the iOS-based devices, the iPhone and the iPad pattern. Uh, if you are interested, yeah, you can download. We summarize some of the key patterns uh, in the iPhone, uh, uh, in iPhone, which you, if you find it useful, you can uh, download it and take a look at some of the pattern. Uh, I can just briefly explain some of the important pattern to you. Uh, one is the GUI for the iOS home screen the grid of the icon design, right? 
So this is uh, one uh, uh, industrial design or design pattern thought by Apple. Uh, whenever you open your phone, when you see many, many icons where you can click, this design was actually protected by Apple. Right? Eventually, Apple uses uh, this, all this pattern that I share with you now was used successfully against Samsung. Okay, uh, when the Apple sued Samsung. And the other design pattern that I would like to share with you is the protection of that screen with the button design. And you can see that, you know, there are dotted lines in this uh, design application. The dotted line are the design, the parts that we disclaim, the Apple purposely disclaim, and they only protect the shape of the screen together with the button. So anyone can come up with any shape, but if you use the shape of the screen and the button, you'll be protected. So this is the right way to protect design. You, you disclaim the parts that you don't want to claim, and you only focus on the part that you want to own, which is the shape of the screen and the button, so you can cover different types of shape. And also on top of that, the shelf, the, the shelf, the casing of the phone was also protected. So when they protect the casing, they only protect the outline of the casing, but they disclaim uh, the button and the screen design because that screen and button design was protected in the earlier pattern that I share with you. So by doing that, even you can protect the shape of the screen and the button and also uh, the outlook, the outline of the pattern. And some of the interface introduced by Apple, uh, the touch screen interface, you know, in such a small device, you take away all the buttons. So there must be an intuitive way where you can interact with your smart, uh, with, with the touch screen phone. So this is one of the example of the uh, interface, the intuitive interface that Apple has introduced, which they have patented. Uh, uh, this pattern uh, 7844915 is about, you know, uh, the phone able to detect whether you have one touch point or two touch point. If it's one touch point, you switch to the scrolling mode, you can scroll up and down. If you detect two touch point on the screen, it means you want to enlarge, you want to scale the view, right? So this is a pattern uh, which is claimed this, this method of scrolling with one finger and enlarging with two fingers was actually protected by this pattern. If any phone uses this idea to give instruction to your phone to scroll or to enlarge the page, it will be infringing this pattern. And if you read the claims, yeah, this is what it says, right? Mode is a single touch point, means the scrolling mode. The double touch point means the gesturing mode. If you have the single scrolling mode, you can scroll the window. If you have gesturing, you can scale the view. So if and and Apple and and a lot of uh, smartphone later on also follow this and they infringe Apple's pattern. The other function which is protected by uh, interface function, which was in, uh, protected by Apple, is the tap to zoom function, where you know uh, the the whole the, the the system the software actually separate. Uh, the screen into different grid, different boxes of content. So, and when you touch on one uh, finger posture, uh, you can tap to enlarge that that uh, box to indicate that you know to to read the content. Uh, when you touch, uh, not only uh, the box will be enlarged, the text will also be resized to fit the box. So this function was also patented by Apple when they introduced the iPhone. And the other pattern is the bounce effect function. Like when you scroll your pages and you come to the end, right? So, and when, when, your, when the device detects that your finger is still there, it allows you to show the pages. But when your finger is taken off from the device, then the page will bounce back to the normal document. Uh, this is called the bounce effect uh, function. So when you have a long document, you will just throw your, 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 your document. And when it reaches the end, right, uh, you will see the edge, the black color edge. And if you release your finger, the, the document will bounce back to show you the normal document. And this is actually also patented by Apple 
in its iPhone. And these three products, all, all this uh, patent that I mentioned to you was copied by the later competitor like Samsung. And, uh, and the other function is on the volume rocker on the side where you can uh, use your one finger to open, to, uh, to, to raise or to lower your volume. Uh, this was also patented. This is a hardware pattern covering, you know, the first, second fulcrum, and uh, those fulcrum were con connected to the electrical contact and connected to your uh, processor to control the volume. Uh, this is also uh, protected by Apple uh, when they introduced iPhone. So uh, what happened was it is a revolutionary product and all competitors look at the new product and they change their key phone to touch screen phone almost like, you know, immediately. And uh, one of the most uh, fiercest competitors is Samsung. Samsung come up, came up with the Galaxy iPhone-like smartphone Galaxy series. And, you know, of course, Apple has to do something because all, all this function was so uh, innovative and, you know, spent so much uh, in coming up with the new R&D, you so much on R&D to come up with a new product and you have found so many patterns, you have to put the, the patterns to work, right? So if you look at the Galaxy phone before and after, before uh, Samsung's phone are all key phone, after Apple, you know, the Galaxy phone become touchscreen phone and Apple Android's phone uh, at that time, you know, uh, copy a lot of Apple's iPhone functions and features and Apple took an action in more than, you know, in, man, in multiple jurisdictions, uh, but uh, I'm focusing on the US action here. And uh, the cost of action by Apple was first on trademark infringement because Apple had registered all this icon, right? All this phone, uh, all the messaging apps uh, icon, the photo icon, uh, the contacts icon, and all this icon, Samsung also followed. So this is one ground of infringement. The second ground of infringement was Apple relying on the design, right? Uh, remember I mentioned about the grid uh, design, the outline design, and also the screen uh, and the buttons design. And this was also copied by Samsung. Even though Samsung changed the shape a little bit, but they still use the icon. Uh, they, they still use the screen and also the button at that location. Uh, then it will become an issue for infringement. And also the pattern uh, in the Galaxy's uh, smartphone, they also have the tap to enlarge, uh, one hand to scroll, two hand to enlarge, also bounce at the edge function was also copied by Galaxy. So using all this IP, uh, Apple was able to get injunction in some jurisdiction, including Germany and Australia, but it was a long, long battle fought in many continents and after the seven years, of course, Samsung being a huge conglomerate, they also counter sued. Uh, but at the end, the judge, the jury in US decided that, you know, uh, Samsung was liable for IP infringement and it was ordered to pay Apple 539 million US for damages, right? But the actual damages was not disclosed, but this was the amount uh, 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 reached by the jury. Yeah, so this is one of the examples of how iPhone protect itself. Yeah, and, and also, uh, not only the phone was copied, the OS was also copied. The operating system, iOS and Android actually follow a lot of the function proposed by iOS. A lot of functionality was actually uh, in Android. And what Apple can do again to face this copycat was to take action to slow down Android. And uh, in the case of Android, what Apple did was it then up with a few other players like Microsoft, Ericsson, and they bought over about 6,000 patents from Notel. Notel uh, had a portfolio of patents touching many aspects of telecommunication including some OS functionality. So that pattern was bought by this conglomerate of companies 
and they together came up with this consortium called Rockstar. And the Rockstar actually sued uh, Google and the Android universe for copying some of the function uh, protected by the patents, right? So, you know, when uh, Android was launched, uh, Apple was very, Steve Jobs was very angry and uh, in his autobiography, uh, it actually said that he will go thermonuclear uh, to go after Android and Android is actually a stolen product, right? So, and, and the, the thermonuclear uh, uh, reaction is actually a patent suit, right? By 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 the rock star, and uh, what what happened was uh, the case was settled, right? Again, uh, Google have to settle the case with the rock star, and you know the matter they have to settle with terms not disclosed. So, but uh, yeah, we we see that Android is still uh, uh, operating, but uh, they they have certain arrangement uh, regarding the licensing. So so. With that, you know, uh, I probably come to the end of my presentation. Uh, Apple has done fantastically well. It is the world most valuable company now. Uh, it at, at its height, it reaches it reached a three trillion in valuation. Uh, now it's still a two trillion dollar company. Uh, it has uh, climbed from the time iPhone was launched to now. It has gone up fifty eight times. Yeah, during this uh, 2008 and 2022, it has gone up 58 times. Uh, standard uh, S&P 500 gain is only about 23, uh, 2.3 times, right? So you can see how successful uh, Apple is, and Apple is able to uh, create a lot of value because of its very its thing different strategy is very. Uh, uh, innovative uh, solution and also it's very strong IP portfolio. So with that, I come to the end of my presentation. I probably would like to uh, give to uh, Jai the floor to continue the Q&A session. Jai? Yeah, all right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lok, for the presentation. So, yeah, uh, It's interesting to learn about the efforts and uh, strategies that Apple have put into building their IP portfolio. So uh, we have now uh, come to the Q&A session. So we will take some time to answer your questions. So, yeah. So the first question is from Mr. Uh, Wei Hui Chua. So he asks, since Apple is no longer producing iPods, so can we sell something similar to the iPod or file a patent application of something that is uh, quite similar to it? Yeah, uh, iPod's patent will last for 20 years. So you probably would have to wait until 20 years is over before you can start uh, producing iPod. But more importantly, uh, Apple uh, product is, uh, is, is working is... Apple is selling an ecosystem. Yeah, with an iPod, uh, you still need iTunes in order for you to uh, download music and distribute music legally. And iTunes is another IP that you have to overcome. And also, uh, uh, the 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 various other uh, IP surrounding iPod. So so it's not a one uh, patent product. Uh, it it is protected by a series of uh, patents. So. So if you want to do iPod, uh, you probably have to uh, do a due diligence on all the IP owned by Apple. Yep. Yeah, Kumar has uh, given his comments too because he felt that the demands for iPods are not as huge as back then because there are also a lot of music subscription services like Spotify or even Apple Music. So and then he felt that uh, it may not be a good investment and uh, getting a patent might be very challenging due to the existing prior arts. So if uh, Mr. Chua wants to patent something that is similar, he needs to make sure that there is at least something that, that is novel and inventive. So something, an additional feature to make it patentable. All right, so Mr. Chua also has another question. So he asks, how does Apple handle the protection of its 
intellectual property in the context of acquisitions and mergers? Yeah, sometimes uh, if you can, uh, you look at the current strategy of Apple, uh, Apple is making uh, inroads into AR, VR, uh, AI, uh, and some of the medical solution. And instead of developing their own IP on AR, VR, or AI, uh, Apple took the strategy of acquiring the existing patent fought by this, uh, some of the leading AI company or VR company and using merger and acquisition to own IP. Uh, that's a, a faster way, you know, where you can own IPs. So I don't know whether this is uh, your, your, do I answer your question? Uh, your, your protection in the context. Yeah. Uh, one of the ways to speed up the building of IP portfolio, especially when you enter a new space, is through acquisition of another uh, IPs yeah, that has value to your uh, new business strategy. All right. So, yeah, moving on to the next question from uh, Mr. Sunny Fei. So, he asks uh, whether how does Apple's patent litigation history reflect on the company's approach to protecting its IP? I couldn't couldn't get your. Where's the question? Did you share with me? I, how how would the? Yeah, IP... it was it was just recently posted. So. Yeah, he, yeah, he was asking. Think, uh, yeah, Apple was able to uh, slow down at least some of its competitor using the very strong patent portfolio it has. Uh, uh, in the case of Samsung, you know, uh, it forced the competitor to at least modify some of the key features. Uh, yeah, so if you're you're asking me whether it's effective or not, I think definitely, you know. It, it is able to uh, stop or slow down some competitors from eating into its competitive uh, core competitive edge or you know areas of core competitive edge. Yeah. So uh, yeah, perhaps uh, they have also uh, used a different approach to uh, targeting on their competitors. It depends on what the activities of their competitors as well. So, all right. So, uh, Kalpana asks, while deciding IP strategy, what kind of considerations should be kept in mind? So, yeah. seeing Apple's IP strategy, it seems that they have offensive approach instead of defensive. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, IP can be used for both offensive and defensive approach. Defensive is for you to secure freedom to operate so that no one can sue you for using the idea. And offensive is if you need to use it, uh, you can uh, use it to deter uh, your competitors. And the reason why we are doing this uh, pattern strategy series or IP strategy series is to try to link IP strategy to business strategy. And you can see, right, IP strategy has to come from business strategy. And business strategy is where you decide which areas that you want to differentiate yourself from your competitors. In the case of Apple, what they want to be different is to come up with something that gives better user experience, right? And come up with a product that looks nice, uh, easy to use. And along that line, they develop solution, come up with very cool looking products, coming up with easy to use interface. Right. So this easy to use interface is in line with your business strategy, how you become, you are different. So you, you come up with this area where you can be different. And IP strategy is for you to own those differentiation. So IP strategy and business strategy, they are interlinked. You cannot say I want to be like this, but you develop anything not following your strategy. So the Canva, the uh, strategy Canva become relevant. Uh, the strategy Canva is actually developed by the Blue Ocean strategy and where you will decide what are the area that you want to increase, what are the area that you want to reduce. So in the case of iPhone, it decide that you want to reduce the number of models. Apple doesn't have many models, only two models. Reduce the number of buttons, increase the price, increase the ease of use, 
increase the create a customization. So I think you probably can can use that Canva to strategize your business. Where you want to increase and create is where you need to file IP. Right? This is what we will try to say. Okay. So uh, the next question is from uh, Mr. Seng Yu. So he asked how to determine the price of a given pattern if someone wants to buy it. There are, there are many valuation, cost valuation, where you, know, you put in all the money that you spend developing the IP as one basis of valuation. The other types of valuation is uh, you can do a discounted cash flow of the total uh, royalties that you can collect for your IP over the lifetime of the IP. So, you know, that's called economic uh, valuation based on your discounted cash flow, your royalty discounted cash flow. Uh, yeah, so, so uh, very subjective, right? These are all very subjective, uh, but uh, you can work around these two different uh, valuation basis. And the third valuation basis is uh, a market valuation, meaning, uh, you know, uh, my market valuation is like you look at the market market value of another similar IP and you compare with your IP, but because every IP is unique, so market valuation may not work that well. I think the more accurate one will be a discounted cash flow valuation of how much total royalty you can collect and that will become the value of your IP. Okay, so I uh, yeah, there is another question from Mr. Tewu Choi. So he asks, is there any method to manage IPs that are that Apple is no longer using? So because Apple still sell those things after its end of production. So that's his question. Uh, if if the the IP is still uh, valid, then uh, you will be infringing the rights of an IP owner to use the IP. So. So you can't, uh, if they are not selling, but if the pattern is still maintained by the owner, it means you can't use it, right? So that's the simple answer. So Sela Chin asks, will NFT replace IP? It's two, two separate things, you know, M M M M M NFT is a, a digital, uh, immutable digital copy of your digital content, right? So uh, it, uh, NFT is not IP. Uh, you know, when you have an NFT, you buy an NFT, you don't buy the IP with the NFT. Uh, NFT is just the digital uh, copy uh, of the digital content, that's it. Uh, so it will never replace IP because it's, it is not IP. When you buy a digital, Con, uh, an NFT, you don't actually acquire the IP. The IP still belong to the taker or the creator of the content. So it's two different things. So it will not replace IP. All right. So I don't think we have any further questions. But yeah, if you have, you can always uh, contact us to us. Again, if you are interested in downloading our handbook for today's topic on Apple, uh, yeah, you can just scan the QR code over here. So I'll leave this page for a few seconds for you to scan so that you can download the handbook. All right, so just a reminder, our brand new uh, pattern case study series will start uh, on the 30th of March at 2 p.m. Singapore time. So the topic is on Amazon. So if you are interested to learn more about Amazon, uh, it's pattern strategies because we'll be focusing on pattern this time. So please register by scanning the QR code over here or you may just contact us uh, at these phone numbers and also this email address. All right, so yep. Yeah, we do provide a 30 minute uh, free consultation session uh, to uh, new clients. So if you have any questions uh, relating to IPs, uh, whether it's for prosecution or litigation or even monetization. So feel free to contact us to arrange for a meeting. So our contact details are over here. So thank you everyone for participating in today's webinar and also thank you, Mr. Lo. Thank you very much everyone for attending. Uh, uh, do join us for our future series. Thank you.